Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very generous uh, uh, introduction. And um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I will start um, by maybe providing something that you mentioned, um, uh, an example for something that you mentioned. You mentioned your conversation yesterday um, about the different situations in different countries. Uh, and maybe just to make it um, a little bit more um, uh, understandable uh, what the situation in this country is and what uh, the dilemmas for courts, legislators, uh, and inhabitants of these countries are. Um, uh, Wunsiedl is a small town in Bavaria. It is close to Nuremberg and uh, demonstrates a typical Bavarian beauty. It also has a cemetery. When Rudolf Hess, Adolf Hitler's deputy, died in a German prison in uh, uh, this, the 80s, his remains were returned to Wunsiedl, his birthplace, and buried, uh, and buried there in, in the local cemetery. Ever since, this place has become a mecca for neo-Nazis. Organized by a Hamburg lawyer, Jürgen Riege, the demonstrations attracted year after year a significant number of participants, culminating in an um, impressive crowd of 5,000. It's half the number of the town residents in, in 2005. A report of a leading right-wing activist is featured on a neo-Nazi website. I'm guilty, I went there to read it. Uh, in this, he tells, how, um, it tells us about um, a gathering in the year 2003, which took place in an atmosphere of folk festival, with people taking, uh, taking over the streets and squares of the little town and hasting the flags of German lands and German Reichs, in plural. Uh, in his speech, the organizer Rieger praised his straightforward and non venal nature, making him to the good consciousness of the German state of that time. After the initial annual marches in the late 1980s, the demonstrations were banned by local authorities uh, as a threat to public order. But after the federal court has narrowed uh, the interpretation of what can be deemed uh, uh, and understood under this term uh, a threat to public order, it was around the year 2000, the local authorities and local court had no choice. All their attempts to ban the gatherings were struck down by, the high, by higher courts, uh, and this process that reversed lethargy of the right-wing scene in the late, which, which um, appeared in the late 90s and allowed ever-growing crowds pilger to the grave of the a leading Nazi criminal under the protection of their constitutional rights. But after the German Bundestag has reformed the criminal provision for incitement, it is the famous uh, section 130 of criminal code, uh, they added a provision explicitly outlawing assemblies that endorse, glorify, or justify national socialism regime. Um, and the courts uh, started upholding the, the ban of these demonstrations. So the organizer, Jürgen Riege, he went to the courts, went through all the instances, et cetera, et cetera. And then we had uh, a, a, a um, very interesting and very important decision of the uh, a court of the um, German constitutional court stating that it is an infringement of, on, on, on free speech and, and freedom of assembly to ban a demonstration like that. But this infringement is covered by the intrinsic value of German constitution, uh, its remembrance of the past, and uh, its, its attempt to prevent the lessons of the past, uh, the, the, the horrors of the past to be repeated. So this is just a brief overview of the situation where we are, of the dilemmas and the tensions uh, in this particular country. And this is uh, as a reaction also to, to your remark where you said, well, uh, it is different in all different countries. And actually my research uh, uh, on this I called contexts of anti-Semitism. And some of these contexts are national contexts. In different contexts, we have different uh, um, room for reaction also legislative room and so societal room for reaction to anti-Semitism and different need, necessity, to react to certain forms of anti-Semitism. In the following, I will try to um, uh, give you a little 
taste of how um, anti-Semitism is being is is framed in the legal uh, perspective here in Germany. I will talk especially. I will not talk so much about the Holocaust denial. Uh, I will talk more of a different segment, which is probably not that relevant in in practice. Uh, it is not dealt with uh, by the instrument of incitement uh, to violence, etc. But it is um, an, an, another instrument, uh, not from incitement niche, but from uh, uh, a protection of honor, which is in Germany also a very important uh, instrument of, um, of criminal law, uh, the um, crimes against honor of people, and how the courts have, in Germany, have used these laws to protect honor of Jews who lived in Germany, and what the results are, uh, uh, from my perspective. And after that, I will um, uh, try to give uh, my view of what are the societal, not the legal, but the societal grounds for this. Because I think that this is very important uh, to bridge this, uh, um, these two disciplines, and not to stay within the legal framework, but also understand what drives the legal uh, aspects of, of this. And we all know that um, court decisions are not made in, in heaven, <laughs> right? Uh, they are made here, in this context. Uh, and, and they are influenced by our societal discourses and by the threats that people mm, see here. So just briefly uh, to understand where we are. We are in sections 158 at se uh, and, and the following sections of the German Criminal Code. And these uh, sections are, especially 185, uh, uh, they um, protect, they're, they're termed crimes against honor. Uh, section 100, uh, 185 is not called crime against honor. It's just, it, it, the word honor doesn't appear there, but um, it, it's called the insult, beleidigung. Yeah. Um, so the, the good which is protected by this, uh, this provision is honor, and it is very doubtful, and there are many people who, who doubt that honor is a constitutional term because it's so vague. I mean, how do you define what, do, what, what, what we should protect? And don't forget, this is a criminal, these are criminal charges. Um, in fact, um, a, a German author in 1988, and this was 1988, is already 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, he found 60 various definitions for what order is in the legal uh, literature. And now, with the diversity in our society, with different terms and understandings of honor, what it means uh, um, for our diverse uh, groups, and also with the globalization, we will have probably many more understanding what order means. So uh, the, the courts have struggled what is this little puzzling concept? Uh, but the German Constitutional uh, Court said in an important decision, he said, this is, and, and it repeats it again and again, uh, it's a constitutional. It's not anti-constitutional to punish people for uh, infringing on honors of others. So, and they, and they found a, a little um, spiel how, how they define order. They use the so-called normative factual definition of honor, normative faktischen uh, begriff of honor, which means um, uh, according to its ruling, an insult infringes on both the inner honor owned by any individual as bearer of intellectual and moral values, nicely said, and his good reputation within the society of fellow humans. So it's both how we feel, how does it insults us, yeah, hurts us, and how we are being deprived and devalued in the eyes of others. Uh, there are different shadings of this. I'm not, I'm not going to go uh, there. But another in important and interesting uh, um, uh, factor in this owner protection um, is that it is a deeply personal, um, um, pers uh, person-focused, yeah, individual-focused crime. That means uh, that you have to target an individual, and that means that you actually cannot target a group. Um, and this is, I mentioned this because when we, we, we compare, and when we talk about uh, uh, insults of Jews, and when we talk about defamation in general, very often this defamation is not said individually, it is said about a group. And um, that's, um, it, it's interesting how German courts deal with this um, in the example of, of protecting the honor of Jews. So um, in this context, the protection of honor of Jewish individuals is interesting from two perspectives, which I mentioned first. 
which statements are considered to infringe the honor of Jewish individuals, and second, in how far judgments about Jews as a collective are considered by courts in Germany to constitute a personal insult punishable, by, uh, uh, punishable under section 185. Um, I will uh, briefly describe uh, the, the developments in both of these areas, and my statements, my hypothesis is that we are witnessing here, if we look at the post-war uh, um, um, post court practice, uh, we're witnessing two phenomena, which I call uh, one, uh, historization or um, historizing, right, from history, of the protection of Jewish honor in Germany, and the second, I call it objectivization. It's actually not a good English word, but uh, I, I couldn't find anything better. Objektivierung uh, um, of this of this protection. Uh, so let's let's start let's start with historizing. Uh, since the Lut decision of the German Constitutional Court, uh, it was a, a famous foundational decision. Um, well, basically, courts go in three steps. They first determine uh, is the the area, the constitutional uh, protection of free speech, is it infringed? Uh, if yes, uh, does it violate the dignity of the person? Um, if it does, then this free speech is, is banned, is not allowed. Uh, the Würde, mentioned Würde, as, as the outer, outer limit. And if, if it is not as intensive that it, it violates your human dignity, then you weigh it uh, um, against um, the other limitations. And, and uh, there you have, you, have different, uh, you have different validations. So when they talked about, about Jews, they uh, employed both of these limits, the dignity and weighing uh, a, a freedom of speech against other goods. Uh, throughout the post-war history, um, the courts frequently had to decide on whether or not a statement would infringe on human dignity of Jews. The reason was that assault on dignity was one of the elements of crime of incitement for a long period of time. Most courts referred, uh, referenced national socialist ideology as a litmus test on whether a statement constituted an assault on dignity of Jews. Early on in, in its history, the uh, uh, German Constitutional Court uh, has to decide on criminal prosecution for distribution of a pamphlet with numerous uh, accusations of conspiracy against Jewish bankers. And the judges stated that by degrading Jews as collectivity, the publication denied them a full-fledged right to life as a citizen in the state community and therefore infringed on their human dignity. The court also underlined that in determining this infringement parallels to the ideology in the national socialist state and the dramatic results of this ideology were to be taken into account and they were decisive. In a different case, Writing a word Jew on a poster of an election, uh, electoral candidate was interpreted by the court as incitement to preclusion of Jews from ex exercising public offices and therefore to their exclusion from effectively participating in shaping public community life, which in turn was deemed an insult on dignity of the electoral candid candidate himself, who by the way was not Jewish. Drawing on parallels to national, national socialist uh, um, persecution were also an integral part of this decision. In another case, uh, the federal court has reversed a lower court decision, and it was a more recent case, which had denied an infringement of, um, uh, or rejected an infringement of, of dignity um, of Jewish persons through a statement of a defendant. The federal court observed that the lower court had overlooked the national socialist world outlook of the defendant, which in turn affirmed that this statement contained an assault on dignity necessary for persecution or incitement. So in this case, the, the decisive element was the national socialist outlook of the person, not the content of the statement. But the, the federal court said uh, the lower court, uh, court has analyzed the, the statement in, in, in the wrong context. The context should be the outlook of the person. And if it is a national socialist outlook of the person, then it is banned. So we see that there is this uh, ever always repeating uh, um, theme of, um, of national socialist parallelism. If we find them, it's no problem. We can ban it. Uh, the questions that, uh, that, that this poses is, of course, we will ask them later. What if we don't have this, uh, this ideology, right? I, I, I will uh, start with this later. Uh, 
There is a more recent decision of, of the Berlin District Court, which shows how similar interp interpretations flow into civil cases. Regarding permissibility of a PETA campaign, PETA is an, is an organization uh, defending rights of animal, animals, and this was a big case here. Uh, the PETA campaign against inhumane treatment of animals. A series of PETA's posters, they were huge, all over Germany, all over Berlin here, um, showed closely planned, uh, um, planned up and crammed animals in animal farm on one side of the poster and pictures of concentration camp prisoners on the other side. The court had to decide uh, and, and it was also, there, there was a, also a, a statement, uh, I think, Holocaust on the plate. Um, uh, so, uh, so in terms of that we all who eat uh, animals uh, treated like that are guilty of the same. The court denied a case, um, um, the court had to decide if the freedom of speech of the campaign organizers had to yield uh, behind the dignity of the Holocaust survivors who applied for injunction uh, together with the Central Council of Jews in Germany. In its de a decision um, uh, confirmed by the Supreme Court of the State of Berlin later, uh, the judges decided that the content of the posters constitu constituted an insult to the applicant's uh, dignity. Uh, the court denied the case of a detraction. They said that the, the campaign organizers did not slander on the Holocaust victims or degrade them uh, because they had vindicated concerns. Uh, their purpose was to criticize inappropriate conditions of mass animal farming. Nevertheless, the calibration of freedom of speech against protection of honor were not necessary. So this third step was not necessary. The, the court said that the dignity of the Holocaust survivors was violated here um, through equating their, their sufferings uh, with the conditions of animal farming, etc. Um, why is this relevant and why and, 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 uh, was it important to talk here about the dignity and not go into this uh, realm of balancing one against each other? If you talk about dignity, you can talk about dignity of de dead people as well. If you talk about honor, and, and, and the, the so-called right of personhood, Allgemeines uh, Persönlichkeitsrecht, um, you cannot uh, um, apply it um, uh, to the dead people. So there was a, 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 there was a, there was a problem there. Uh, and um, actually the, the Constitutional Court then um, um, uh, took this on, this case, uh, rejected it. They said that we do not uh, re reverse the ruling. They basically concurred with the ruling, but they corrected it a little bit. They said uh, the dignity was not, uh, was not uh, infringed here, and we do have to do the weigh weighing um, one against each other. But they said that um, uh, the, the, the functionalization, uh, um, no, no, no. they said that uh, in the consequent weighing of freedom of speech and concerns of the claimants, the Constitutional Court decided that the poster um, constituted an infringement of the right to personhood of Jews living in Germany. So not those who perished in the Holocaust, but they said this picture infringes of the, on, on our personhood, on my personhood, all other people who live here and who are Jewish, which is also an interesting concept of basically forming and constructing our honor. And that's what I will talk about later as well. Um, so we have a couple of these examples. I will just give an, a, a couple of other examples um, which will, will show in which direction this is going. I'm leaving a couple of them out so that we are not too over the time, too much of the time. No, we'll have Q and, a. And, and, and we have to have Q&A. But there are a couple of um, other examples. I'll just uh, try to, 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 to talk about them from, from the, the head of my, uh, from, the, from the memory. Um, uh, one interesting uh, example was the question of whether someone who is um, uh, a termed a Jew in a, uh, a magazine, it was a magazine in, in Bavaria, I think, again. Um, it was an election um, to uh, the city council and the, the candidate for the culture, cultural department of the city was a Jewish person. And this magazine on the cover had the statement, um, these candidates are running for our dep uh, department, city departments, um, um, uh, finances, um, XXX, um, uh, something else, XXX, I, I, I have it somewhere in the text. And then culture, a Jew, um, then in the text, um, it was said that uh, the ca this candidate running for culture uh, is an energetic uh, person, a Jew 
from Berlin. Other candidates' uh, religious uh, affiliation was not even mentioned. So the question is, what do we do with that? Uh, the court said uh, this is a problem. But the, um, the higher courts um, actually said no, um, it's, it's okay, uh, because we don't have uh, here the context uh, uh, or, or any hints that this was a racial uh, or racist national socialist ideology involved. And they say if we don't have such hints, then we have to choose between different interpretation of the statement. We don't know what the person meant. Uh, this statement can be either inform informing, informatory, or defaming, defamatory. And in this case, we have to opt for the one which doesn't bring any liability for the person. So we, 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 the, he's not national socialist, uh, and therefore it could be a defamatory, uh, it could be an inf informatory uh, statement. Um, in a different case where Michel Friedman, one of the leading, the then leading uh, uh, Jewish politicians here, was called Tsigoyna Yude uh, uh, by an NPD functionary, um, they said that this one is, uh, um, is liable because Tsigoyna Yude, this combination evokes, invokes the uh, ideology of Nazism where they brought gypsies and, and, and Jews all together. So what we see here is that um, this um, repetition and, 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 and references to national socialism um, is constitutive. It becomes constitutive to not only how we deal with crimes, but also, and this is something we might talk later, I just don't want to take too much time, um, it also uh, constructs a certain honor of Jews, which I... Um, uh, uh, have a special term uh, which, which, which sounds too German and too, uh, uh, too it's not important. It's a, I call it the social, factual, historical honor construct of Jews in Germany. Uh, it means that um, uh, on the one hand the courts have continuously emphasized the factual aspect of the honor of Jews, not the universal standard rooted, rooted in un universal understanding of every person's dignity is at the heart of the honor construct of Jews, but the factual social expectations against the background of the peculiar German-Jewish relationship, and as a product of assumption about Jewish people's sensitivities. Uh, the constant references to the ideology of National Socialism places the honor of Jews in Germany into a strong historical perspective, therefore factual historical honor construct, and makes its factual nature even more striking. Somewhat counterintuitively, such historization limits, not expands, the honor protection in the long run. The historical fixation makes it difficult to prosecute forms of anti-Semitism that do not resemble the historical patterns of national social ideology. And finally, the protection of honor of Jews in Germany is perceived as a vehicle to keep and strengthen the social validation of Jews in the post-war Germany. The purpose is to protect the new social reality of a German-Jewish dialogue by means of civil and criminal uh, um, instruments. Uh, uh, the other example is the um, persecution of collective libel. Uh, very briefly, uh, the uh, usual, since uh, the, the usual theory, the usual dogmatic uh, understanding is that collective libel is on, can be punished only by exception, uh, and it, it, it goes back to the imperial court. Uh, 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 the imperial court uh, stated that, uh, for example, Jews could not be protected under the libel laws uh, because they were a group which was not, where the borders were not clear. This is, if you say something, you know, the, I know that Jews are dirty, right? Um, then the, 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 the understanding is the group is so large and so amorphous and so you don't know uh, who belongs to it, who doesn't belong to it, that this insult, this attack, does not pierce, the, I, I would call, you know, that does not pierce the veil of the group towards the individual. And because it, it's not, it doesn't become an individual um, assault, uh, you cannot persecute it as, a, as, as an insult. This was the, the underpinning, the theoretical underpinning of this understanding framed by the imperial court. Now, after the World War, uh, the, new, the, the German courts took over this uh, understanding and they still say the same, with one exception, and this is the exception of Jews in Germany. Um, 
this had also historical political reasons. The problem was that you could not persecute a Holocaust denial because we didn't have for a very long period of time, we didn't have a provision which was inserted in the early 90s, uh, which explicitly says that you can ban Holocaust denial. Well, we didn't have it. So the courts were looking for ways of how to get there, uh, how to ban this speech. And they used the insult paragraph, 185, uh, to, to get there. But again, uh, the people are dead. <laughs> Right? The Holocaust, uh, you can find the Holocaust survivors, but, but, but most victims would not go to court, to, pro to German courts to prosecute them. So the, the, the challenge was how do we make out of it a group assault, which still is uh, liable and uh, is protected by this highly individualized uh, criminal provision. And that's when uh, the court said that in Germany, due to the history, um, the, the Jews are such a group, identifiable group, and has such a special relationship with the whole, in the whole societal context that uh, um, every Jew is uh, insulted if the Jews as collectivity are insulted. This is not the case by, in case of Turks. This is not the case in case of, of, of Christians or women uh, or Arabs or foreigners, but it is, in ca it, it is the case in case of Jews in Germany. And this also poses interesting questions, uh, which I we can then discuss in, 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 in our discussion. How much time do I have, Mr. Well, Moderator? Let's say that we want 10 minutes for Q&A, so you have five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Then in five minutes, I'll try to, 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 to um, um, summarize what uh, I take from it in, in the societal from a societal perspective. And I think it's, it's very interesting to try to summarize what, why, why did we get there? Um, and, and very briefly from my research, I think that we're dealing here with three, uh, with four different functions of law uh, um, uh, in this area uh, employed um, uh, in Germany. It's law as a symbol, law as a defense, law as reparation, and law as places of uh, commemoration. Um, law as a symbol is, is quite clear, but it's also interesting. It's, um, we have a lot of uh, symbolic law, uh, laws. Um, uh, very often laws are there not to be effective, but to send a signal. And, and this is what we have um, in, in case of anti-Nazi law in Germany. And, and 130, uh, section 130, ban of the Holocaust is just one part. We also have ban of uh, uh, Nazi symbols, we have a ban of Nazi literature, et cetera, et cetera, and organizations. Um, so this is by, 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 by having uh, these exceptions, these little exceptions for Jews, Right? And this is what we're talking about, is uh, you have a, a theory, you have a certain theoretical underpinning, and then you make an exception, you, you correct it in a way that it actually, in these particular cases, does work uh, and, and uh, make people, make things punishable um, or penalizable, whatever you want to use. So this is a confirmation of societal ideas and norms by doing this. Uh, which manifests in, in this in this writings. There is an interesting uh, dissertation by Claudia von Davids from uh, also from this department on the nature of symbolic law, and also um, uh, uh, Professor Hernle, who is going to speak. Uh, she's not here, I, I guess. Who's going to speak here tomorrow? Uh, she wrote also uh, um, a, a, a very interesting book on that, where she also mentions uh, this symbolic uh, laws. Um, whereas they always um, focus on laws as, as um, acts, you know, by, by parliaments, as parliamentarian law. And here we have very often, and, and act actually mostly, uh, uh, law as spoken by courts. And so we see th also the, the special um, role of courts who actually frame and form this particular relationship. Uh, well, but the symbol, symbols is not everything. It's also, uh, I these laws are designed also to be effective. So we're talking here about the law as defense, Recht als Abwehr, as I call it. And uh, uh, this goes, if we talk about this, this goes back to uh, actually the concept of militant democracy. Uh, we want our uh, democracy to be stable, and we do not want the enemies of democracy give uh, uh, hum uh, human and, and um, uh, basic rights with which they will be able to abolish human basic rights in the, in the long term. So it goes back to Karl Lovenstein and Karl Mannheim who actually framed this, this concept in the 1940s wa looking at fascism and Nazism. Uh, but I think that the idea is clear. Uh, this, the, uh, 
The third um, uh, concept and dimension um, is something I think is, is uh, undervalued. I think uh, that these laws also fulfill um, uh, a, a, a their role and still do fulfill their role uh, as part of uh, trans transformative justice, uh, as, as part of uh, reparational um, uh, aspects. Reparation, we usually uh, think about them in, in monetary terms, and this is easier, you know. It's easy to, to do reparation in monetary terms. You pay it and it's over. Uh, but reparations are also uh, used by many, uh, um, uh, many theorists uh, in, in more than money. Uh, you can do um, moral reparations. And um, I think that uh, in this case, um, and I outline in, 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 in which particular cases, uh, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's worth looking at it uh, uh, for two particular reasons. When we look at it, uh, reparations and transformative justice goes along the line of many generations, right? So it's not, it's not a person-to-person -person, uh, concept. Uh, it is actually part of this, and very often the, the transformative justice uh, kicks in only after one generation has died out, and you have it in the second generation where two collectives are trying to get to, to terms, um, peaceful terms with each other. And I think this, in this case, it is an interesting uh, uh, concept to internalize and to think about how many generations we will have it, and is it okay to have it in the second generation? Uh, and when the first generation is gone, why does the second generation want anything under these laws, right? This is the question that comes, or the third generations, they're not survivors. Well, if we talk about it in, in terms of transformational justice, uh, uh, transformative justice, and reparations, there you have, you, you have different answers that you can give to that. And the same as uh, tr transformative justice and reparations, they also go along the ethnic and cultural lines between two groups who are this, uh, often citizens of the same country, but they have different backgrounds, and during the conflict they were in different lines. And I think this is also an important um, um, aspect, which otherwise is very hard to grasp. Why, why should this go along, and who is Jewish? Why should the Jews and not others, um, et cetera? If we talk about this in terms of reparational justice, it's, it gives us a special language to, to grasp this. And the last uh, thing I mentioned, is the function of law as a, a place, uh, a place of memory, uh, uh, lieu de mémoire. This is a concept uh, by a, a French uh, social scientist, Pierre, Pierre Nora, um, and and this there we are in the collective memory realm. Uh, and uh, actually, Pierre Nora and and many of his followers they try to identify um, places, both geographical and non-geographical, which are in our which serve in our society as the role of uh, preserving memories in different contexts in different ways. Uh, so, for example, there is a, um, a, a, a there, there is a um, work on Deutsche Erinnerungsorte, right? And they uh, uh, frame Duden, yeah, which is a German uh, lexicon, a, ger a German uh, um, uh, dictionary, as place of uh, place of memory. It keeps the memory of a nation in terms of language. Or they uh, talk about uh, the, uh, sorry to mention this in this context, but about the works of Richard Wagner, right? Uh, as as a, a also a place of memory because it is a locus where memories of whole nation become, uh, are kept alive. So, and, and from my perspective, I think that we should start talking about the German law in this area as a place of memory because there we have three things going on. We have, uh, preservation of memories by these laws. We have telling of the memory narratives through the process of generating these laws, right? We, the, the, the German law, uh, the constitution, or some of these this, um, uh, um, decisions, they are telling a story of, uh, first of all, uh, how it was during the Weimar Republic and, and the Nazi Germany, but they're also telling a story of the German Federal Republic. What is it what we don't want to be? And, and why is it possible and important to create a narrative of our new identity? And the final, uh, but I think very important, and if you read many of these decisions, you, you will sense it. It's also, uh, um, uh, uh, this law is also a place of exercising memory, um, actually remembering and commemorating. The, uh, many of these decisions, when you read how German judges wrote about these things, you actually feel that their both discomfort, but also their um, the grief uh, that they had 
while discussing things like that and remembering the Nazi past and seeing it in the present and drawing their conclusions. So this is very briefly. I actually had a couple of more, more timely, um, you know, relevant uh, conclusions, but we can discuss this later. If, if